what's better than earning money from a nine to five job? It's earning money while you sleep, which is made possible if you start investing. You're listening to the Real Estate Investing Demystified with your very own dynamic duo, Ava Benasaki and August Biniaz. Tune in as we discuss everything real estate, both on the passive and active sides. We feature life-changing stories of today's real estate leaders that will help build your own roadmap to success. This is a show that will lead you to diversified portfolio, a much bigger revenue, and a next level venture that brings you a smooth cash flow. Let's get this episode started. Okay, August and everybody listening, we're joined by Jared Ash today. That's right. We are joined by Jared Ash. But before getting into our tremendous guest and his background, which is very interesting and fascinating as it relates to real estate private equity, quick background about life and what's happening. Yesterday, the Fed raised the interest rates by 50 basis points. Yeah, we knew that as, was coming. Yeah, as forecasted. Mm-hmm. Um, it did create a bit of a bull run in the markets. Um, so that is a, a deviation from the level of interest rates that were increasing, which was 75 basis points for, I think it was five times in a row. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Really good news for so, us because we were, yeah. Yeah. It's good point. news, but uh, it's, they, they, they also said they're going to continue raising until they, you know, uh, get, bring a control over inflation. Yeah. Uh, other, other things to Just update. Just following the data on what's happening. Yeah. I'm really optimistic for buyers in 2023 and 2024. So I think everybody just get your investors ready because there's going to be some incredible opportunities that we're going to be able to lock down. Are you talking about distress deals? I'm talking potentially? about the distress deals. Okay. <laughs> sounds good. For sure. I agree. I think I've, I've had four or five conversations that said, look for Q2 for distress deals. For go. sure, for there sure. You we'll go. bring you in in a quick second yeah, here, Jared. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to say is, uh, uh, last thing I want to talk about is, you know what? A lot of times, I've, I, a lot of people watch our show. They don't watch it or listen to it all the way to the end. Okay, yes. Where we have our 10 championship rounds to financial freedom, where we ask these 10 questions from our guests, which creates amazing dialogue and conversation. So if you're listening to this or watching this, make sure you watch the show to the end to get to watch and listen to uh, 10 championship rounds to financial freedom. You really get to know freedom. more about the guests and then you fall in love with them and you're like, I like that person. They're yeah. awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I like Jared because Jared actually told me that he's all about mindset and abundance, which is our kind of people. 100%. Um, so 100%. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead. I'm going to do a quick uh, bio, which is an incredible bio. So guys, listen up. Jared is a partner in Crown Capital and in charge of building relationships with investors. Jared is a general partner and an investor in apartment buildings in Houston, Texas, Lubbock, Texas, and Louisville, Kentucky. In addition to his work with Crown Capital, Jared is the founder of Capstone Government Affairs. Now, Jared has over two decades of experience in government affairs, economic development consulting, and is an expert at building relationships. Jared has a master's in public administration from American University and a bachelor of science from Florida State University. Now, Jared currently serves in the city of Walnut Creek as a transportation commissioner, and he is on the chairman of board of advisors to the Contra Costa County Transit Agency. Jared is a two-time Ironman and an avid triathlete. He lives in San Francisco Bay Area with his wife and three children. August is super excited about that, everybody, because... August also. I have done a sprint triathlon, which is 50% <laughs> of an actual triathlon. So I barely made it, but I ended up at the top 15% uh, well, getting that. off the couch and doing it. But Getting off the couch and doing it. There you go. Now, we believe this interview with Jared will bring great value to real estate investors looking to raise more capital and close on larger deals. Welcome, Jared. Thanks Welcome, so much Jared. for being on our show today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited, guys. Let's dive into things, Jared. Can you just start off by please tell us about your background and your start in real estate? Yeah, I uh, have spent about 20 plus years in the government affairs space, and I excel at building relationships, as you said, right? I started on political campaigns doing fundraising, and if you're asking somebody for money, you have to know why they want to give and what's going to motivate them, and it's the same thing 20 plus years later in, in real estate. I started investing in real estate maybe five, six years ago now, started buying single family homes in in the San Francisco Bay Area that was too expensive. So I started out of state through a turnkey provider and I own several homes in Memphis and I get nice cash flow. But I I sat down and did the calculations of, do I spend $25,000 on a house 
uh, and I get like 350 to $500 back in cash. And that's, that's a pretty good return, but on a monthly basis, but it wasn't necessarily reaching my goals, which was significant cash flow uh, on each month, enough to cover my mortgage property taxes and car payments and car insurance. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it wasn't saving me enough money monthly to redo the bathroom for my wife instead of uh, instead of putting the 25,000 to a new house. So I said, how do I scale? And that's what led me into the multifamily space was I spent about a year and a half, two years, really just studying this space, watching it and seeing what the opportunities are. And now instead of calling people for a losing political candidate, sometimes winning, uh, it's I'm calling people and saying, hey, can I make you 10% cash back on your investment? Can I double your money over five years? Uh, in a hard asset. And I'm having a different level of conversation. So that talks about a little bit about me and my mindset. Awesome. Awesome. Just for me to quickly jump in and break this down a bit more. So you're in single family, you're investing in single family, you want to scale, you 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 get into multifamily and multifamily is an incredible asset class for a legacy asset for people to try to grow their personal wealth and generational wealth. But we're also talking about you getting involved in real estate, private equity, in syndications where you're not only only buying these assets for yourself, for your family, you're also raising capital and syndicating deals. Talk to us about when you realized syndication even existed, because for me, being in real estate for uh, you know well over 10 years, I knew there was large funds, I knew there was black stones of the world, but I didn't know that groups could syndicate and just raise capital from retail investors. That's something that way later in my career, I realized and got excited and got involved in this business. But for yourself, what was that? At what point did you, what type of research did you do to even realize that you could raise money from others to buy bigger deals, deals or larger deals or syndicate deals? Yeah, great question. So I think it started uh, by listening to podcasts like this one, right? Uh, the real estate guys, Bigger Pockets, two of the bigger ones in the industry. I was listening to both of those. It's just an out of state single family investor. Like it was important for me just to understand the process and everything. And uh, I think along the way, you know, I heard enough people speak and then some other people were doing podcasts and I listened to those. Uh, people like yourself and myself. And just one conversation led to another. And as I continued to network within the space, which is what I do is build relationships. One person refers me to another, to another, and it starts me on this journey. But I had a goal in mind. And my goal has always been that cash flow number, which pays my those couple of key items that I was talking about in life and that's what's driving me is to hit those goals and to help then others hit those goals awesome awesome right on next question i so you mentioned you are a lobbyist still and yes. could you describe to our viewers and listeners what is a lobbyist and how this background helped you in connecting with more investors yeah, so think about me as a middleman. Most of my clients are uh, selling something to government more than we're trying to change policy. They, which sometimes we are changing policy, but they have a widget to sell to a city hall, to a school district, to a state government agency. Maybe that widget is software, maybe it's solar panels, maybe it's gunshot sensors or prisoner communications, whatever it is. We're trying to connect into government uh, to do that. It's a relationship game. And so I'm sort of your middleman, your mayor's golfing buddy, so to speak, and have that relationship and can say, hey, mayor so-and-so, city manager so-and-so, I'm working with a client that does this. Are you interested in you know, that? Does it fit your goal for sustainability, let's say, in the city? Can I provide an introduction for you? And can I help usher this along through bureaucracy? And it's a relationship game for your clients by having those relationships with elected officials, with city officials, state people, I'm able to help uh, move things along for my clients. So it's all about building relationships. Well said, nice. and that's very, very true. Um, now, 
I'm really excited to dive into the, you know, inv- building relationships with investors and, and talking to you about a, a couple items that I'm really excited to get your opinion about. But first question is when discussing investors, is it quality or quantity? Quality of the investors or the number of like, or which aspect? So let me dive into this a little bit more because this is actually something that I'm struggling a little bit here at CPI Capital. Um, we we know that building relationships is the number one thing when it comes to you know keeping investors, building trust with them, and and really having them feel like they're taken care of. Um, but when you have so many investors, and it's a good problem to have, when you have so many investors coming through your funnel, how do you keep up with keeping those relationships tight knit? And, and not losing track of, of really people. Also, I, I could add to this as yeah. well, because this is the uh, discussions we've had a lot of time as well, is, is obviously our, our resources uh, are, are limited, our resources and time are limited. So we can put those resources and time to cater and nurture and communicate with the current investors who are part of our database, or we could put those resources and time into bringing more investors into the funnel. And that's the struggle we have felt inside is should we create more strategies? Should we do more shows? Should we do more initiatives to bring more investors in? Or should we just concentrate on the investors that we have who are sitting on the sideline who haven't maybe haven't pulled the trigger and invested with us yet? So maybe we can touch on that side as far as quality and quantity. Uh, the difference between it is should be just at all times, should syndication groups or people who deal with investors always be in the pursuit of bringing more investors into their uh, you know realm? Or should they be very focused on finding, uh, you know, uh, and and refining the investors they have already in their database kind of idea. Because it is a one-on-one relationship that you're trying to build, right? You're not just sending out to a, a big database you are, but those investors that you get on a call with, you do have to get on a call with them, maybe on a quarterly basis. I'm looking more, I'm looking forward to learning more about how you do it. Yeah. So yes, I mean, quality over quantity, but I also believe it's a numbers game. So my, my theory after talking to a lot of people in the space is if you have 250 to 300 investors, like qualified accredited people who want to invest, have invested in something else, you will be able to fund any deal from a capital raising standpoint that you have. Now, how do you get 250 to 300 people? you're not going to bat a thousand, right? Which, um, so not everybody who is going, you're going to talk to or who is following you on social media will fit into that top group of quality, 250 to 300 people. And most networking books out there will tell you 250 to 350 people is a solid set of relationships that you can maintain professionally um, on top of like your you know, the people who you see outside of your kid's school or your spouse, things like that. You, but to get there, I believe you have to talk to 1200 people, which means you have to outreach to even further. And I became good at political campaign fundraising and nonprofit fundraising when I created this strategy. And I do think it parallels to, uh, capital raising for real estate investment, which is to compare it to a big dance in high school. Uh, And if there are a, if you are the only guy in the room and there are a hundred women and you could use this in different scenarios for whatever your, your preference, women could be the, do this too. You're going to have to ask a hundred, all hundred of them out, but not all hundred are going to want to dance with you and not you know, more than maybe two or three are going to want to ring from you, (laughs) Uh, but you're going to choose one of them. And, you know, it's about having quick conversations with people about starting the communications, but also finding out who's serious, right? Who wants to invest? And then it's also listening to them. So you build quality relationships with those people. But I think you have to ask a hundred people to dance with you before you can find the 10 that will say yes to a dance and find the ones that you're going to date and the ultimate one that you're going to put the ring on their finger. 100%. Amazing. Okay. Now 
Now my next question is. Could, 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 I, could I just follow, yeah, follow go, up there go, if you don't go, mind? Go. Sorry. Absolutely. Uh, so so uh, an advice that I got about uh, you know the, what we're speaking about is you know it, it, just like life, investors are the, the relationship with GPs have with investors are very similar to relationship we have in life. Sometimes no matter how much of a kind and a great and awesome person you are, certain people don't automatically don't like you. You just grind their gears and this just happens. It happens to me against others or others to me. It just happens in life. Everybody likes me, August. It, it, everybody. I was going to say, everybody likes me. <laughs> so, 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 so well, they might not like me. So, uh, you know, as a result, they might just, uh, you know, not, not partner with us. So but say, what uh, can I talk to Ava, please? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 um, so what I'm saying, what, what I'm trying to say is that there, there are certain people that it doesn't matter how great your deal is. It doesn't matter how great the returns on your deal is. It doesn't matter how great your track record is. They might just not click with you or uh, they might just not align with you. So I totally get that you need to have th these large numbers. To, that's why it's called a funnel really in, 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 in sales and marketing is because people come in and then they, you, 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 you end up with uh, the, you know, the, the people that align with you, want to mm -hmm. invest with you and the, and the people. So there is definitely a balance we need to have in getting people coming into the funnel, also vetting and going through those people. And, and then, but when you do have that base, that, that, that number, I had a smile on my face when Jared talked about I did too. Uh, yeah. 250 to 350, we're, we're like, we have over 500 accredited investors that Ava has spoken with. Uh, 600 and has, now. Almost. 600 now, yeah. It's and and and, uh, and and not all of them have invested with us. No, a lot of them are sitting course. back. We had an investor who was uh, been talking to us for a year and a half to finally invest in our last deal. So we know yes. that it takes time. It takes time. Yeah. Um, but, but it is that balance between bringing enough leads through your funnel, vetting them, seeing if you're right fit for them, if they're the right fit for you, because this is somewhat of a marriage. Yes. And then also nurturing those relationships and keeping the communication so, going. Let me talk about that for a second, which is building that relationship with the investor and how I approach it, right? Uh, when I get onto a group conference call and people are like, eh, oh, that's, that, that's, Ava's, here. that's Ava's next question. Don't, don't, don't break it. Ava, go ahead. All right. All right. Go yeah, ahead. This is gonna we plan, we plan for that we're one. Gonna, we're going to promote this everywhere. So <laughs> here we go. Um, but before we get to this next question, I just wanted to quickly ask you, an investor signs up, they see, they see your content somewhere. They see what you're up to and maybe they sign up. Um, they want to learn more. Or they come to one of your events like I showed up the other day. It or, was a great, uh, great event, by the way. Or they come up to one of, one of your events, but they show interest. Um, now, how many times do you reach out to them and try to get a hold of them to see, you know, hey, jump on a call with me or so forth? Or do you let them come to you because they're, you can see they're opening your emails. You can see that they're engaged. Um, so I'm just curious, like how many times would you reach out to somebody to actually get on a call and kind of, kind of force them to connect on that zoom call to get to know you and then you can make them fall in love with you kind of thing. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's funny cause we were just having a discussion with my partners at crown capital about this. And I am of the philosophy that I want them to come to me, the investor to slightly come to me and then go the. And then I'll go get them at that point. So what does that mean? I want them to open, download it and open our ebook. I want not just sign up for our Facebook or LinkedIn page. I want them to attend a, a meetup and discussion that we're doing. I want something from them. We're offering all this content, all this energy. Are they opening the newsletters? Now, if somebody has been opening the newsletter 20 times, I want to go talk to that person. And so I will chase them for a call and I'm not, you know, running after them and swinging a, a, a rolling pin, like the little lady in the cartoon. But what I'm doing is I'm going to offer them the time and say, Hey, I'd like to talk. I'd like to get to know you and to do that. I don't believe as soon as somebody likes our Facebook page or something that that's when it goes to it. And that's the quality and the quantity balance, right? I want to know that they're interested in me before I put my time into them. But I want to get to know every single person who is also interested in knowing us. Got it. If they go, if they go a foot, you'll go a mile kind of thing. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Ava. awesome. Okay, Jared. Because we did, we did some research on you, so we didn't want to give up this question. It was, uh, it was... <laughs> all right, all right, go ahead. All right, here we go, Jared. So not to give up any secrets. 
Um, but you have a very unique concept you follow when connecting with investors. So I'll let you get into it, but it's something about asking how the weather is on an investor call might not be the best question. (laughs) It's you guys are in Canada. It's mid December when we're recording this, I assume it's a little cold outside, right? (laughs) (laughs) At the same time in Phoenix in July, it's hot. And so when I get onto a group conference call, my theory is if if nobody knows each other and they're sort of trying to banter, everybody's like, oh, what's the weather out? Oh, it's great. You know what? Those things are obvious, but that doesn't get to know somebody as an individual. That's not why are they going to invest with you and trust you with their money? That's not what is their why? What is driving them? Why would they want to invest? What do they do for work? What's important to them? Uh, And that is essential in building a relationship with somebody. So I laugh at when I get on a call and somebody asks me about the weather because I try to pivot that to knowing What vacation have you taken? What's your dream vacation? What is your son in the Little League World Series championship right now? Is your daughter in a drama class or vice versa, right? Like what's really important to these people? And I give an example. I was just talking to somebody who is 83 uh, about a month ago in investing, and he wants to get in and out of every deal in less than three years. Why does he want to do that? Because he doesn't feel like he's going to be around in more than four at 83 years old, his words, not mine, to be able to to worry about it. He wants in and out of a deal and that's his time period. So I don't want to bring him a deal that's five or seven years because I also don't want to bring him a deal that's an equity play on a turnaround. I want to bring him cash flow because that's what that gentleman wants. Talk to another, a couple who are probably 38, 45, somewhere in that range, have two young kids are trying to buy their primary residence, but they want to get their primary residence out of cash flow from investing. And they have a number of other deals. Those are two very different style people, but they both had goals. They both told me about their families and about other people. And so you really just want to know somebody better and what is driving them to invest in you. And when you talk about the quality over quantity, what I did was I talked about starting with these higher numbers at that dance, but I want to find the people that we both want to dance together, right? Right, right. That makes sense. So just listening to you talk, is it fair to say that when you get on a call with an investor, you really start the conversation off on a personal level? You don't really talk much about business and and the returns and you know the business model and so forth is that is that fair to say you really get to know them i try yes okay very cool not everybody's so open but so then i just sort of go with the flow but yeah i like to get to know people to the best of my abilities uh just because I, I like that and then you could follow up with them yeah that's right and then may i ask how long do you usually spend with an investor for the first time 20 to 30 minutes okay it doesn't have to be long. Nobody wants to talk longer than that. I mean, sometimes yeah. they do, but well over an hour, which each investor call. Sometimes not not so much anymore, but yeah, sometimes the conversation gets going. But I, I booked I'm, calls I'm, more. Uh, <laughs> you're she's more interesting than I am. So <laughs> I don't even awesome. get any investor calls. So you know. <laughs> you're not investor relations. Okay, okay. You want to know, like, just something simple, like, yeah. hey, you're a skier in in Northern California. Oh my gosh, there's been so much snow early this year between like mid-November and December. What a great start. If somebody's a skier or boarder, that's a great way just to ping them again and follow up with that relationship. And that is how you continuously build that relationship. And you could, I could generally get that out of people. I mean, some go a little longer, some go shorter, but. Yeah, totally. One of my secrets and investors love this. Um, I'm not the star. Are you giving up secrets of CPI (laughs) capital? We cannot do this intellectual uh, information. Abundance mindset, okay? Okay, Abundance mindset. I ask investors, what are you investing in right now? And then we get on that talk about, you know, whiskey and all these other cool things. Art, like all these unique things that we never thought about. And they get really excited about it. And then and then I talk about my investment, which they're excited about. So yeah, thanks for sharing all that uh, stuff with us, Jared. Um, I was wondering, do you recommend coaching for investors who want to raise more capital or maybe some other resources, books or, you know, courses or um, yourself or, you know, let's 
talk about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've never gone through a formal coaching program. Two of my partners went through uh, the Michael Blanc program. To me, I like to learn more hands-on than some of these programs. So um, I've attended workshops. I've attended conferences in the space. I like that aspect. I like participating in panel discussions. I love listening to podcasts. I feel like there's a ton of free content out there where I would hire a sort of coach is uh, in a very specific area that I want to improve. Uh, so might that might be a social media fix, right? Tell, how to tell a better story. Uh, and I'm working with somebody on a series of, of one minute videos. And we were going, frankly, from a start of FAQs on like real estate. What does cash flow actually mean? What does conservative underwriting mean? And I'm now looking at changing those to what I like to talk about. I mean, we might still do some FAQ videos for our website, but what I really want to promote is these videos about me and mindset and abundance, because that's what I've spent the last 10, 15 years really studying and getting passionate about. And the advice on that from somebody in the marketing space was tell your story, right? People want to know you just like you want to get to know your investors. And so hiring somebody like that, I have found helpful or to solve a technical problem for you uh, on how to automate something that is, is helpful. And then for, for other things, I do like you, the three of us have talked about mastermind groups, mm -hmm. uh, moving into running a paid mastermind group where it's holding people accountable, but it's people who are going through the same difficulties and challenges I am uh, at various different periods and coming together to solve them from, from everybody's own experience uh, in a way that's beneficial to everybody. I love that idea. It's a yeah. great segue to, into our next question. And uh, yeah, we want to talk about mindset and uh, other items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Earlier, we kind of discussed how you leverage your background in government affairs to excel in your real estate investing business. Now, let's discuss another superpower of yours. So you also do Ironman competitions, which is not, not an easy thing to do. Um, so maybe you can talk to us about it and connect, you know, doing Ironman with the business world, if you, if you would. Well, what you should know about me is that I am average. I am nothing special in a lot of ways. I uh, was destined to be middle class. Um, I was the guy, I wasn't picked last on, on all the teams in high school, but I wasn't picked in the first 10, right? And so I was I was never believed that I could be wealthy. I never believed that I could be the rock star. Uh, that was just not the way I was brought up. But within that, nobody ever said like, what do you mean you wanna do an Ironman? You wanna, wanna run a marathon after you've biked 112 miles? Oh, don't forget I have an hour plus swim before that in cold, generally cold water. I've never done a swim in warm water. And, you know, when you go and achieve that mindset, when I actually did that physical activity, which the first full Ironman I did, and I did a lot of smaller races along the way, you got to start somewhere, buddy, um, is, yeah, it's about 10 years, no, 11 years ago now. And I think that's what first changed it for me, because once I realized I could do something physically that nobody believed I could ever do, that I never believed I could do. I didn't say I was winning the Ironman. I'm a finisher, but I'm proud of that. And I made decent time. Yeah. That told me I could go do anything I want in life. And that led me through a cousin, through a best friend, starting to read books, listen to audio books, podcasts, all about improving my mindset overall in every area of my life. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. We really look up to that. Like, you know, just, just kind of being, we call it a, a supreme being, but um, having that discipline uh, just shows you discipline within business every day. Like I always say that, you know, have discipline when you get up in the morning, make your bed. 
you've started the day off with success. But doing the Ironman just programs your brain to have discipline in everything else. And, and August and I are big, big believers in that and the way that we live our yeah, life. We might be doing the spring triathlon here in UBC. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Ava is not a very it's good on. swimmer. But, it, but, but I'm a fast runner. Yes. So maybe I'll... You are. Maybe I'll... You know what? I'll tell you, I'm a fast swimmer. I get out in the top 15% and running was never my thing. Oh. And by the time you get to the run course, all the runners are passing you because you further to run more time on running than in swimming so don't go. worry about it okay right. thank all you right. for that all right great let's get to the next segment of our show thank you so much for your transparency and share, sharing every, all your golden nuggets with us yeah, uh, jared. You, jared we're, we're, we're into the next segment of our show all right the 10 championship rounds to financial freedom so whatever comes top of mind are you ready for this let's do it let's do it okay who was the most influential person in your life I'm going to go back to my gr probably my grandfather and my elementary school principal, who I should also point out was my next door neighbor. Um, and my grandfather, my mother's father was just, he, he just was my driving force. You know, he was my rock in life when, when I needed it. And um, I think that principal was just so friendly, so encouraging, just inspired education and life and, just the two of them. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay, next question, Jared. What is the number one book you'd recommend? You know, I'm a big fan of Hal Elrod's The Miracle Morning series. It is just this concept of getting out of bed first thing in the morning, almost before the rest of the world wakes up and starting your day off right and how to do it with affirmations and exercise and journaling and, and meditation to just really get your body and mind into that right spirit. Right on. Okay, next question. If you had the opportunity to travel back in time, what advice would you give your younger self? That you will be successful, that, that there is more to life than what you are being told to look at that bigger picture, that the whole concept of mindset and abundance to your riches. Right on. Nice. I love that. Um, okay, Jared, what's the best investment you've ever made? Uh, proposing to my now wife. Very sweet. Okay. Now, what's the worst investment you've ever made and what lessons did you learn from it? I, in, in 2007, I bought a, I was living in Miami South Beach at the time. So the other end of the country. And I bought a condo with no money down that was overpriced that with no money down on one of these like low interest, interest only deals, which was exactly what was the mortgage crisis that led to the great recession of 2008 was. And I walked away losing money even after I had moved out of the place and walked away uh, to pay off debts and everything else. So that I just didn't know what I was doing. I was following a fad and I didn't really study real estate or investing at that time. And so it's it's actually part of what's led me to this is taking the time to learn about real estate and do things right. As a general partner, you definitely have to had gone through some of those blood, sweat and tears uh, times. We all got to have a nightmare story. It makes you stronger. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Except for me, I think I would just graduated in 2007 high school. Yes. <laughs> so I didn't get to go. Um, next question, Jared. How much would you need in the bank to retire today? What's your number? Yeah, you know, I've never put that together because my right now I believe in acquiring just more. So I would say I, I would look at a cash flow number more than money in the bank. And if that's the case, I'd want the equivalent of to fully retire of four to five hundred thousand dollars per year coming in in cash flow. Passive. I, I like I like that you said that because you actually started off by talking about how you were you were you know calculating your bills and how much passive income do I have to make to pay my mortgage, my car payment, my insurance. That's the amazing number. I love it when people say that because it gets the listeners thinking about that's possible. Wow, I want to work towards that. So thanks for sharing that. Um, next question: If you could have dinner with someone dead or alive, who would it be? The two of you. Let's meet. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Dinner on us. We'll meet in the middle somewhere. Let's, let's do it in person, not just on Zoom. One hundred, brother. One hundred. Perfect. Now, if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing now? I'd be a, a lifeguard 
on a tropical island somewhere and um, maybe a ski instructor. Nice. <laughs> Seven lives. Seven lives. <laughs> All right. Oh, this is my favorite question. Book smarts or street smarts? Because there are both. Um, you know, you, you've got to have EQ, emotional intelligence, uh, to be really successful in this life. But you need to always be be reading a book and and doing things and learning. Uh, but I'm a hands-on learner, so that's the street smart. Right on. Okay, last question, Jared. If you had a million dollars cash and you had to make one investment today, what would it be? Our next deal that's coming up, 8% cash on cash, 16% uh, IRR on, on your return. Woo. Nice. That there sounds, you go. That sounds he believes in his own product. <laughs> there you go. Awesome, man. All right. Perfect, Jared. Uh, just really quickly, please let everybody know uh, what is the best way that they can reach you? Yeah, you can find me, Jared Ash, A-S-C-H, on LinkedIn. I am the only one on LinkedIn with that spelling. Uh, and you can follow Crown Capital Corp on LinkedIn, as well as uh, go to www.crowncapitalcorp.com. Awesome, awesome, man. Thanks, Thanks brother. Being... Have a great holiday. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We hope this conversation enlightened you on how to win big in this highly profitable and risk-adverse space. Get on your feet and embrace this world that offers so many opportunities just waiting for you out there. Continue your journey to becoming a savvy real estate expert by subscribing to the show at cpicapital.ca. Don't forget to leave a positive rating and share with your friends. See you on the next one.